I've always said your home should be a healing sanctuary. We spend about 62% of our waking hours in our homes and basically 100% of our time sleeping there. So you think we'd optimize our homes for health, but the opposite is often true. From invisible toxins to mold and EMFs, many of our homes are actually making us sick. Our guest today is someone who calls himself a building biologist, and his mission is to improve the health and lives of all people in all buildings and communities everywhere, every day. This is the story of building a healthy home with Ryan Blazer. Ryan, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. We just went through some technical difficulties before and we had to restart this and, you know, looking at all the EMFs and everything that are all around me kind of freaks me out. But even before we get to all the things that may be troubling us in our home, I wanted to address this thing that I saw that that you were in three plane crashes previously. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I've, I've grown up around airplanes. I'm a private pilot myself, a lot of experience in small planes. And I've had uh, two engine outs. One of them, luckily, we were over a field. We landed in the field, uh, flipped on our backs. We were able to walk away. Another time, engine failure. We we're in the desert out over Arizona. Uh, we were able to land in the desert. Uh, both of those walked away. And then another time, come in for landing, just practice landings. And a, a gust came and took the lift out and we uh, kind of crashed the front of the runway there. Uh, all those times walked away. Very lucky. You so, walked away. Or are you still flying planes today? Still flying planes. Yeah. yeah. Still love you, it. you got it. You can't let that scare you, right? You got nine lives, six to go. So <laughs> six more. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to appreciate life when you go through those kind of things and, and possible real scary death scenarios. But there's this other kind of flip side to it that we may not see these life or death scenarios in our own homes, but slowly they may be poisoning us. How did you start to get involved in this idea of testing your home and, and creating a very healthy environment where you live? So in my 20s, I had a business. We designed and created the environmental systems for nightclubs and restaurants and high-end churches where we would do the sound, the lighting, the video, the acoustics, anything to stimulate the body, the positive side of the environment. Uh, really fascinating how the outside world does affect the inside world, our mind, our body. It's a big interaction. Uh, about 12 years ago, although I was living in a home that ended up having a bunch of mold in it, I was restoring an old vehicle, sanding on the, on the metal, and it had lead in it. And I got lead poisoning, also a stressful relationship at the time. So kind of a perfect storm. I got really sick. Started realizing oh, there's a negative side to the, the environment. And we kind of shifted into, instead of creating these cool stimulated environments, let's focus on creating healthy environments. And kind of shifted our focus into that and just kind of been off and running ever since. Uh, just because I realized there's such a big problem in the world that with these unhealthy homes, the sick building syndrome is the term that's coined um, off of these buildings. And it's a big problem. And, and then there's not a lot of people addressing it. So that's where we kind of stepped up to the plate and we're trying to handle that problem. When you look at sick building syndrome, which is uh, something more and more people, I think, are, are starting to acknowledge or even understand that, that we are living in an environment that can absolutely contribute to sickness. What are some of the things that really stick out to you? Is there one thing that's that's bigger than the rest that really you see? I would say mold and EMF are right there neck and neck as far as affecting people. Uh, right underneath that, I would say chemical usage, poor air quality, our water is getting pretty nasty. I mean, it's all up there, but really mold and EMF are the two big ones. With mold, you know, what what's the first step you tell someone as far as, hey, I think I have mold? If they've ever had any kind of leaks or water damage or water issues or flooding, or if they don't feel well in their home, but then they leave, they go on vacation, they go to work and they start feeling great again, or they wake up with stuffy nose, respiratory type issues, that's when we're going to want to start looking at mold. And then what would you recommend testing wise? Because there are a number of different tests out there, right? That the medical community recommends. There are now kind of commercial kits you could purchase online. What, what do you recommend? I recommend we can look at everything because there's so many different tools and every tool will give us a little slice of information, but not one single test is going to give us the whole picture. So air samples are going to tell us what's in the air right now that we're actually breathing, but it's not going to tell us historically. It's not going to tell us if there's anything behind the walls. A lot of times we can get false negatives. Uh, Hermes, 
On the other side of that is going to tell us what's in the dust, what's historically been in the air. But a lot of times that's going to give us more on the false, false uh, positive side. Yeah. Uh, because the thing is that every home has mold. It's just a question of how bad is the mold and what kind of mold is in the house and how sensitive are the occupants of the home. That's what's going to ultimately determine if we have a mold problem. So when we swipe the dust, we do an army and it shows, hey, you have mold in your house. Well, yeah, every every home has mold in it. How bad is it though? That's the problem. And are we getting affected? So there's those we could, you know, a good visual inspection really goes a long way. And then historically talking to the, the occupants, what has this house gone through in the last 10 years or 15 years or however old the house is? How many flood events have there been? Has there been big leaks? How did those get addressed? And so we got to look at everything. And that tells us the big picture. Yeah, it's really difficult these days because most people move into a home and they have no clue what that history is of the home. And a lot of times you're not going to just see black mold on a wall and say, oh, I could you know, picture it right there. That's mold. I know it's there. A lot of times it's lurking. And I think a lot of it, I, I've spoken to people like Jason Earl from Got Molds and even Dave Asprey talks a lot about molds and you know, the, the, they're hidden and our building materials are perfect kind of uh, conduits for molds. And then the mold expels mycotoxins, which then impact us. Is is there anything we could do beyond the testing to kind of get some clarity on on whether or not there there is mold? It, and symptoms are one thing, right? But are there places you could kind of look to get some idea if something has happened in the past or not? Yes. Um, look for look in all the places around your house that we have water. A good example is the toilet tank. You can go to the toilet tank right after this episode when you're done Listen, lift up the tank and look. Do you see black ring around the top? Do you see fuzzy stuff growing? Because that's a natural petri dish in our house. It's a dark, damp place where we have moisture. And every time you flush the toilet, pulls air in to displace that water. If there's any mold spores in the air, they're going to land around the rim and we're going to start growing mold. You can also look in, in the um, washing machine. You can look in your dishwasher disposal. Uh, you can open up the HVAC system and look on the coils. All of these places are places where we have water. It's dark. It's damp. It's a perfect place for mold. And if also if, if we get uh, cheese and bread and fruit and it seems to just mold really fast, really easily, that's also an indication that we have an excess amount of spores floating through the air. And you know, remediation is one thing. It's expensive. It, it could, you know, cost people a lot. Sometimes it's it's even done. I've seen where there's someone's remediated and they still have mold afterwards testing and it regrows in a sense. So there is no, uh, you know, silver bullet to, to getting rid of mold. But for preventive measures, you're talking about good things here because it is like, all right, toilet, you could see. You don't have to rip up the whole house and start, you know, addressing some mold behind sheetrock somewhere. And I, I do believe AC units are just the perfect area, right? Humidity, hot, cold, and and no one really checks those areas. Should should people be pre taking preventive measures such as just general cleaning of those areas with a specific solution? Yeah, uh, make that part of your quarterly cleaning to go into these areas that are not visibly, readily visible uh, for the most cases and clean them. The HVAC system, you can put UV lights on the coils. That's going to really help to eliminate mold growth in that area and bacterial growth. So, yeah, making sure we keep the house clean and doing regular maintenance goes a long ways when it comes to preventing mold. And are there more natural solutions? Because a lot of people, when we were talking about cleaners, just bring in more chemicals that get in the air that kind of create a toxic environment as well. Because I, I know this, that if you're around a lot of chemical solvents, that could show up in your blood. We test patients all the time that are in the cleaning business or even let's say in the art business or something like that. And the, the fumes from everything get into the body and then they have high lead levels because paint used to have a lot of lead. Uh, are there natural solutions to kind of inhibiting mold and cleaning those areas? Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of people when it comes to mold, they, they just want to spray something on it and kill yeah. it. But we got to think about, let's times that up. If, if we were to zoom in, let's pretend like we had a bunch of weeds out in our yard would we want to go spray a bunch of chemicals on it or would we want to go pick the weeds? You know, the best best option is to go out and actually physically remove the weeds. And that's how we want to treat mold as well. We want to look at it. If you open up the toilet tank and it's all fuzzy in there, you don't just spray a bunch of bleach and close it up. Let's take soap and water and clean it up really good and actually physically remove the mold spores. That's kind of how we want to think about this is physical removal is the key. Are things like ozone water and uh, just ozone in the area, is that something that's helpful? 
Ozone is a very strong oxidizer and it will denature the mold spore, the cell wall and break it down. But there, unfortunately, ozone is very harmful to our lungs. And so mm -hmm. you want to be very careful with ozone and, and it can also uh, oxidize and break down plastics and textiles in our home. Uh, can discolor the TV. So we don't want to really use too much oxidation as the answer. Uh, there is some, uh, there's another gas called chlorine dioxide that works a little bit better. Uh, that's not as harmful, but ultimately, again, we want to come back to physical removal. Yeah. You know, outside of mold, because I, I feel like, uh, you know, there's, there's so much more to it and you're right. I think mold EMFs are, are very big portions of it. But when we look at just the general things we're placing within our houses, Let's go into, let's even start with VOCs. Can you go into a little bit of what we should be looking at, even what that kind of term means to some, to people? Yeah, VOC, it means volatile organic compounds. What that means is that it off gases into the air and we breathe it in. So think about some a fingernail polish remover and someone's doing that. You can smell it throughout most of the house. Now, the chemicals that we're bringing into our house are, are very important uh, to keep track of because for one, a lot of these chemicals aren't tested fully on humans, but none of them are tested in combination with each other. Let's take bleach and ammonia, for example. You mix those two together, it makes um, chloramine gas, which can, can kill you, be very deadly. So we have this toxic soup in our house, and it typically uh, makes up from the off-gassing that's coming from the, the furniture and the building material and the paints. Uh, it can come from the cleaning supplies that we're using. Then we mix in all of our personal care products, the shampoos, the conditioners, deodorants, makeup. Uh, and then we have pesticides that we're adding on top of that. And then potentially uh, herbicides and weed killer from outside that make its way into the inside. And pretty soon we have a pretty toxic soup. You know, you think, well, this stuff's in containers and it's closed up. Well, next time you're in the grocery store, go down the cleaning aisle and tell me if you what you smell. Now, all of those are sealed up in containers, but guess what? It's leaking out. It's creating this low level toxic soup in your house. So it's very critical that we keep anything that's that's toxic out of the breathing air, in, out of the home. I know a lot of patients that, that become very sensitive to chemicals, especially uh, if they've been exposed and harmed by them and everything, but a lot of people aren't. You know, you see this, and I, I used to live in New York City, and every time they'd be using kind of the cleaner indoors on metal, and it's really, you know, pungent. But the guys using it would just be using it without sometimes gloves and it wouldn't seem to impact them. Do you think we've become sort of desensitized to it and the people that are having these reactions that are sensitive are actually the normal reactions we should be having to chemicals? I think that that's there, the norm is to be somewhat sick for all of us. I don't know very many people over the 40s that is perfectly healthy. Right. Uh, it seems like the norm in, in the United States is to have something wrong with you, take a medication for this or that, or even if you don't even recognize it, you just don't have as much energy at the end of the day, or you have a little bit of brain fog or a little bit of irritability. Uh, so when you say that it doesn't affect people, I guarantee it's affecting those people. They're just not recognizing it. They're just kind of pushing through and there's no acute symptoms. It's more of our long-term chronic illness. Right. Those canaries in the cave, the sensitive ones are actually the ones that are kind of, you know, letting us know. Something wrong is out there. And beyond yeah, the yeah, chemical. You know, yeah, go ahead. Some some people do detox quite a bit better than other people. Some oh, people yeah. are a lot more sensitive than other people. So there is a range. I mean, you can go into one household where one person's very sick, three other people are seemingly fine. It just hasn't caught up to them yet. Their toxic load, their toxic bucket hasn't filled up yet and overflowed. That's a really good point because some people say, hey, it's not impacting me. What's what's the problem? Why is it that person sick? They must be something must be wrong with them. But we have to like that's something we look at even in our uh, clinic here is is something we call reaction modes from European biological medicine. You have different predispositions to how you detox certain things. So, of course, it, we, we aren't all exposed to the same thing and have the exact same reaction. We have different, you know, capacity uh, abilities to compensate for these things. So it's really important that we don't just judge someone else's reaction and say, well, I'm not having a reaction. It must be fine here. And if they're having reactions, something is wrong with them. Now, you know, another sensitivity beyond the chemical side is something you brought up as your kind of number two thing we should be looking out for are EMFs. And there are more and more people that are sensitive to EMFs and just being in an area with a lot of electrical equipment. What, what are the things you're telling people to watch for and, and rectify when it comes to EMFs in homes? 
The biggest thing that I talk about is practical avoidance. If we can't avoid some exposure, let's do it. A good example is at night we're sleeping. We don't need to have our cell phone right next to our head with Instagram pinging and, and mm-hmm. voicemails and, and everything going on. We can just turn that off, put it on airplane mode, put it in another room, get a good night's sleep, come back to it. Or like an example, maybe we have a, a gaming station at your house with Xbox and PlayStation and whatnot. That all doesn't need to be on and plugged in and unoperated all the time, exposing you. Unplug that stuff. Turn that stuff off when you're not using it. Go in and use it. Have fun. Enjoy it. Get a little exposure. That's you know, Don't stress about it. But when we're not using it, let's unplug the stuff and not use it. There's so many devices in our home that we're being exposed to on a consistent basis that we're not even getting the benefit from. We're not even using it. So you know, why be exposed to it? Absolutely. I think one of those, you know, that where I, I started this 100% of the time, you're at home sleeping and you're you're placing things that have actual radiation frequencies coming off of it right near us while we're sleeping. And I think Apple even acknowledged this recently that you shouldn't leave your phone charging next to you on the bed because it yeah. is giving off more when it's charging. It's kind of like a Tesla or something. When they charge, they really emit. They're taking in a lot and emitting actually much more during that charging period. So I think there's like these little, little things you could do, turning off Wi-Fi, leaving the phone far away, absolutely are the small improvements day over day that help you get back into the healthy range instead of putting you into the sick range. So those are really, I think, simple ones. When you look, if you were to build, let's say, a home from scratch these days, and you're looking at something like EMF. What are some of the things you would do? Would you wire it differently? Would you like, you know, make your your bedroom where you sleep something of a, a you know, a Faraday cage sort of thing? What what would you do? You know, I'm what I would do might be a little extreme, extreme to some people, but I would put all of the electrical wiring in, in conduit like we do in light commercial uh, and industrial buildings. And that would block all of the dirty electricity in the electric fields. I would also put all the sleeping areas on a kill switch so that we could turn them off at night so that we sleep in a zero uh, energy field as well. Uh, I would also make sure that all the devices and everything I'm using in my house is hardwired. The security cameras, the TVs, telephones, speakers, everything's hardwired. So we're not relying on Wi-Fi. I would shield the bedroom and the sleeping areas uh, on the walls to prevent anything from the outside coming in, especially if I'm building inside the city limits, inside um more urban area. So these are, those are kind of the, the basics that I would do right off the bat for, for EMF reduction in a home. Yeah, I've always thought it's a shame that things like ring cameras can't be hardwired. They don't even give you the option, right? And you've got to yeah. be on Wi-Fi because it is a convenient thing, of course. You could just put it up there, plug and play, connect it to your Wi-Fi. But the whole idea of a security camera, if you're going to turn off your Wi-Fi at night, kind of defeats the purpose because then you, you're you missing that level of kind of security or what you want from it and using kind of security cameras. But, you know, is it that we're going into this ability for convenience over health, meaning the, the, the ease of things we want, but we're sacrificing because of that? Is that what we're doing with our homes? Because we've definitely done it with our food supply and everything else. Yeah, you know, I've traveled a lot and been a lot of different countries. One thing I noticed about America is that we're fairly lazy over here. We want everything yes. to be simple, easy. Lazy is really taking things over. And so if I can sit on my couch and change the light bulb with my phone, I'm going to do that instead of walking up and going over and turning off the light bulb. And that's just the American way. We need to get up out of that mindset because that's damaging because that comes at a cost and that yes. cost is help. And so it's really important that we shift out of that mindset. We don't have to make everything simple and lazy and convenient and automatic. Sometimes we can get off the couch and do some some of this work ourselves. Absolutely. I, I agree with you 100%. There, there is somewhat of a sacrifice if you want true uh, optimal health. You know, it, it, there has to, especially since we've gone this way where we've made everything too convenient, but it's absolutely impacted our health to the point where the majority of us are suffering from some kind of health condition. Yeah, so yeah, a, I, I yeah. had a cl- I want to jump in real quick and tell about a sure. client that I went to their house and I learned a bunch from and they actually set up their house to make it inconvenient. So like the dishes and the silverware they would put on the very highest shelf or the very lowest shelf, the things that they would use the most, their bed was on the floor, the, they ate on the floor and they, and they had their house set up so that they had to work and exercise. And because of that, they didn't have to go to the gym. They were all really fit. But they made their home, they built it into their lifestyle. He, he said he figures he does over 200 squats a day just 
making dinner and breakfast and, and preparing meals and they design their house that way. And, and they just that mentality, when they go to the grocery store, they park at the furthest uh, parking spot. They don't try to find the close spot up front so that they can build in that walking. When, when they're at the airport or the mall, they don't take the escalator, they take the stairs. And it's just that mentality that they're building into these challenges into their lives and that may, inherently makes them more healthy. And when they think about life that way, uh, it really changes uh, how they interact with things and with people. And, and I've tried to adopt some of that stuff and it really does change your mentality when you start looking at life like that. I love that because I completely agree that idea of parking further away and getting in extra steps, that idea of making something a little bit tougher for you, but also knowing it's going to benefit you. I think we've yeah. gotten to this point where everything is just given to us so damn easy. When one little thing goes bad, we freak out. And it may be part of the reason so many of us are depressed and anxious, right? So it's like yeah. we've actually set up our homes to be so, so aligned where we don't even have to get up. We could talk to, you know, our, our Alexa, whatever it is, and and it does it for us without ever getting up. And yeah. now you talk about the laziness of having everything delivered to your home, your groceries, like you don't need to go out. Like I'm actually shocked there's there's more traffic than ever in New York when things like Amazon are, are nonstop delivering to you. Like people aren't going to grocery stores, it seems like anymore, if it could come right to you. But that convenience yeah. comes at a cost and we're literally, we're not leaving our homes. That statistics of 62%, that was at 50% in 2009. It jumped 12% with the pandemic, but it seems that we're spending more and more times at homes in a very sedentary lifestyle, which is yeah. absolutely impacting our health. Yeah. You know, and I didn't realize how bad it was till at the gym was a while back. I seen these two people were fighting for this parking spot, one pulling for the other and the guy flipped them off and it was up close. But then they both went inside of the, the gym and, and was on the treadmill for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. You know? so, what the right. We're going to fight and get like, you know, our, our blood pressure up to be one spot closer to the gym. And then you're going to run indoors for five miles. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's exactly. so counterintuitive so in insane. a sense. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, a lot of what we do is sort of insane. And I, I think a lot of what we've gotten into, especially with our homes, like is a little bit too much. And we have the fire retardant things that leach in. And, you know, so many of our, of our you know, furniture pieces have all these things that have chemicals in them. So what what are the services that Test My Home, your company, are offering to, to try and reverse all this? You know, really just offer my experience and we do a lot of um, consulting online. We do a lot of Zoom consultations where we'll walk through your home with you and we'll analyze. We, we focus on six different areas, air quality, mold, uh, chemical usage, water quality, EMF and lighting. And so we'll dive into those six categories pretty deep in your house and we kind of go through everything and analyze what we're doing. It's kind of like if you hired a fitness trainer or something, you know, we're going to go through and we're going to help dial you in and, and make your home as healthy as possible. Uh, we also have uh, an in-home testing kit program where we can send you a bunch of equipment, some testing equipment, some lab data and, and some videos to walk you through how to take the samples. Then you can get on a, a Zoom call with me or one of the coaches and we kind of go through all the results and help you come up with a plan. Or we do have more of a VIP white glove service where you know i'll fly out for the day and spend the day with you one-on-one -on -one and we'll really dive into your home and get it get it figured out for you so we try to have uh, you know a package for every budget out there i love that holistic and comprehensive viewpoint even with the lighting something so few people really realize when they purchase light bulbs and things like that that absolutely can spike cortisol or in the blue range and everything what is your advice uh you know just general advice for people when it comes to lighting in the home Real simply, match what the sun is doing. If the yeah. sun is up overhead, it's full spectrum and bright. That's how you want your lights to be. If it's evening time and you're seeing the sunset and the red and the orange hues, that's what you want your lights to be. And then, you know, before bed, ancestrally, it was fires and candle lights. It mm -hmm. was real simple, really low light. That's what we want to try to mimic because that's it's no coincidence that we sleep when the sun goes down and we're awake when the sun is up. We're 100% in tune with the cycle of the sun for our yep. sleep pattern. We get those cues based off the color of the light and the intensity of the light. So it's really important to match that. But also with these newer cheap uh, LEDs, you know, that's been around now for a while, that really affects people. That yeah. flicker rate, the vibration, mm -hmm. the flicker rate uh, can cause anxiety. It can cause um, a whole range of different issues with people that I see. So yeah. making sure you 
and the, the non-flicker light and watching the blue light and circadian rhythms being conscious of that for sure it's it's you know we again try and just say light is light right just buy the cheapest light bulb you have there plug it in and turn it on leave it on at night whatever it is but we really don't realize that the impact that has on us i remember T.S. Wiley in her book called The Light Bulb, The Ultimate Endocrine Disruptor. Like once that came around and everyone had one, we all started having hormonal issues. We all started having sleep issues and it became sort of just the norm that you're tired. You, you know, lights are on at night. You're up till midnight or later. People have insomnia, but we have to be able to look at these things and again, create a truly comprehensive healing sanctuary where we are spending all this time. So you know, tell me a little bit because I, I love the term building biology. How, how'd you, where'd you come up with that? And like, you know, how, how do you see that term being applied to everything you do? Well, building biology actually came from Germany. They've been doing mm -hmm. this for eight years where they understand the bu building biology basically means the study of how the building inter interacts with us, with our biology. When we look at the building as our second skin, so we have our first skin, we have the environment of our body, our cells inside, what's going on inside our body. But then we have the environment of what's going on inside of our homes. And the environment of our homes absolutely impacts the environment of our body. And so we got to look at that as our second skin and we got to look at it like a living organism. And we got to look at it for truly how it interacts with us. And so that's truly what building biology is, is the study of that interaction between us and our built environment. I love that. And are you looking at things and recommending things like biophilic design and having lots of plants and natural light and trying to bring nature into your environment? All that stuff. Yeah, there's 25 main principles that we look at and those are those are some of them, yes. Awesome. What about things like feng shui and other like, you know, kind of uh, traditional Western uh, approaches to the energy within a home? Yeah, of course. Yeah. All yeah. that stuff. Great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we there's so much to the environment. We look at and the first thing we want to do is what are all the toxins? Let's get rid mm -hmm. of the toxins first and then let's start adding in all this cool stuff. There's there's biogeometry, there's color, there's smells, mm -hmm. there's the natural lighting, there's our community. There's, there's so many things that we can look at that can help enhance. But the first thing is first is we got to get rid of the toxins in the home and the stressors. And 90% of the homes are at that point where we've got to get rid of the toxins and stressors. It's really funny because like I hear you talking about this. This is sort of the precise approach we have with patients. You know, with that, And it's cool that we're applying what you look at in a sick patient to what you would do in a sick home. Because the first thing you always want to do with a patient before anything is remove toxins. Anything you do that you try and, oh, nutritional sport, this, that, if you're highly toxic, the environment's just dirty, it's nasty, it doesn't matter. You could bring in like a bunch of, you know, cleaner, this, that, but if it's just dirty, like you need to take care of that. So it's, it's very analogous to medical treatment, what you're doing for a home. You're kind of treating the home that way. And at a certain point, you go into things like regeneration within a you know a, a patient's program of treatment, and you also go into the psychology and mental aspects and try and improve on that. Do you see that as well? That transition of like a person's mindset to where they live, and even the idea of a cluttered environment cluttering the mind. Oh, one hundred percent. Entropy is a very real thing. The more things you have in your home can directly correlate to the amount of stress you have. Mm. And so for example, like in, in my bedroom, all I have is my bed. I have two air filters and then I have a chair and then I have a couple of plants and that's it. I don't have anything. I don't have nightstands, get cluttered, none of that. Because when I go in and lay down and get ready for bed, I want to have a clean, clear mind. I don't want to have anything else in there. Same thing with the office. I try to keep it real simple. I have my laptop, a couple of chairs, um, the cabinets behind me are all closed, so I keep all my cluttered stuff behind there. At every single room, you want to have very simple and very distinct for its purpose and not have it cluttered with a bunch of other stuff because that will absolutely clutter the mind. Yeah, I think, again, that's something Americans do a lot of, I noticed. Like if you look at Scandinavian design, it's very minimalistic, sleek, you know, not much there, open areas, negative space, sort of lots of light. And then, you know, a lot of Americans like we're hoarders. You know, that's what we do. We just clutter stuff up. We don't want to give it away. We, we kind of see more as a good thing. The more we can accumulate, the richer we are. But yeah. there is that alternative side of it that the more clutter you have, the more it's going to impact your psychology, your emotional state, all these other things. 
is are there like tips when you go in and, and ask people do you do you do you do like a Marie Kondo sort of approach to things with people it's like does this spark joy if not get rid of it like what's your approach to decluttering your home yeah I do talk about that I'm, I'm a big fan of hers and we use that term a lot I use that with <laughs> yeah uh, yeah, that's very important. You know, once we've got rid of the the toxins and the stressors, then now let's try to optimize the home as much as possible. And, you know, the, the Mary Kondo method, Feng Shui you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of different uh, programs that we try to instill into the, into the home uh, to make it more optimal. I want to hear about some of the, the actual personal stories and experiences that you can maybe share with the listeners about what has happened when this when you've come in, you've helped someone and and they kind of come out the other side, because I'm sure a lot of people here are saying like, yes, a nice home would be great, but it doesn't seem that essential to me. It's like maybe I need to get my diet in check first and, you know, take care of that stuff later where I know this, like where you live impacts you so much. We've had to ask even patients to leave their homes and find something new because it was just a place of stress for them. So do you have any like real like success stories you could share? Yeah, there's a really cool one I like recently that uh, the couple called me up. They had bought a house. They had moved into it and they they were having some troubles and I could tell they weren't getting along very good when they were sitting on the couch, kind of separate. And the wife was like, I'm sure it's small. And the husband's like, you're crazy, whatever. I don't believe in that crap. And I could tell there was some contention there. And so I was doing a Zoom walkthrough and we were going through, and we we're finding, starting to find mold in some places. And I had them go in the crawl space and look, and sure enough, there's a ton of mold in the crawl space. And like, mm-hmm. oh, wow. Okay. So Husband started to get on board. I'm like, we need to get that out of there. In fact, it might be good if you guys actually move out of the house. Because I mean, they were maybe in their mid 30s, early 30s, healthy, good looking, uh, but you could tell they were sick. They weren't feeling well. Um, end up going through helping them get it all figured out. Well, about six months after that, they had scheduled a Zoom consultation with me. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on with these guys. So they jump on, and I could tell that right away they were completely different. They were sitting next to each other, they were holding hands. And they're like, we just want to tell you that uh, you saved our marriage. Like they were on the verge of getting divorced. They were like at each other's throat. They couldn't uh, stand each other. And they fixed all the mold and moved in. And it completely changed. Whatever strain of mold was, was causing so much irritability. The crazy thing is they ended up, they had bought that home out of a divorce. The people they bought the home from, they had also got divorced. And then come to find out that they actually had got back together after they moved out of the house. Oh, wow. So it's kind of a, a crazy story to hear that. You know, something as simple as mold could destroy a marriage. So you wonder how many other situations is is something like this going on across the country and across the world where families are being split up, relationships are being split up for no reason when simple as they're being stressed out because of a toxin. Yeah, we we again overlook that so much. And that idea, if we're not truly optimized, we're not our best selves. We can't be our best selves for our partners, our families. And then things start to become even more stressful between it. And then it's a downward spiral where we we were kind of diseased and, and then the, the disease spreads it into our relationships and goes yeah. from there. And the quality of life just deteriorates after that. So yeah. it's it's one of the things that I find so, so critical. It's like if you want to get healthier, yes, go to the gym. Yes, clean out your like refrigerator, but clean out your space. Look at where you're living. Yes. Optimize as much as you can. I mean, sometimes I see this where people just aren't really cleaning that much. They're they're averse to it. And it's just like stuff on the floor, this and that. And you become like kind of just find it normal and regular. But that's incredibly impactful on your health. Is is there like a a tip to to kind of get started? Because a lot of there's a lot we're talking about here, right? There's you yeah. gotta look for mold, you gotta take care of EMFs, look at all the VOCs, the air quality, your water quality, like. This can become overwhelming. A home itself, upkeep. I know, you know, a lot of people are just like, it's a constant job and I can't even get to the next project because I have so much going on. Are there little starting points so you could have small wins that you tell people about that you recommend to people? Sure. I think one of the biggest things you can do that you can do right away is implement a no shoes rule in your house. Mm. There's so many nasty things that we walk through out in public. Think about when you go fill up your car with gas and the oils and then you go in the public bathroom and there's E. coli and harsh cleaning supplies. Then you go through the park and there's pesticides and herbicides. Well, all of that is collecting on your shoes. And then you walk into your house, you walk through your house, especially if you have carpet. Now that's getting on your carpet. You kick your shoes up on the couch. 
that is horribly nasty. The homes I test that uh, have a strict shoe rule is very much cleaner than the ones that don't. So that's something that, I mean, it may be tough to, you know, if you've got teenagers or the husband, I was the husband that didn't want to do that. And so I had to learn. But if you can implement the no shoes rule, that's a huge, huge win. Another one is simply getting more fresh air. And I know there's parts of the country, you know, Florida and things are very humid where we can't just open up windows and let it in. But if it's nice outside and the climate is good, open up windows and get some fresh air. That's one of the biggest problems with a lot of modern homes is there's built mm. so airtight. Yep. They're so stuffy. Uh, we're creating this toxic soup and there's no ventilation that's that's coming in our house. We have HVAC system that's just cycling the air, but a lot of times we don't have like an ERV system or a fresh air ventilation system. So just create Crack the window a little bit. Get a little fresh air moving through your house. That's going to be a big one. Also, going through your home uh, with EWG app or the Think Dirty app and go through all your personal care products and cleaning supplies and rate everything. Those apps are really easy. You can just scan the barcode and it will tell you on a scale from 1 to 10 how dangerous it is. You know, we went through, we said, okay, everything that's a three and higher, we're going to get rid of. And we did this about seven years ago and went through our whole house. And we came up with like two full garbage bags full of stuff that was considered toxic and dangerous uh, to our health. And so we just got rid of that out of the house and then replaced it with more natural things. And it doesn't take a whole lot to clean your house. Honestly, a little vinegar with water with a little lemon essential oil will clean a lot of your surfaces. You don't need a lot of these harsh chemicals. Um, switching out your laundry detergent. Uh, with natural stuff because your your clothes are right next to your, your body, your sheets. If it has harsh chemicals in it, that's leaching right into your body. So really going through your home and just um, cleaning out the toxins, getting rid of the toxins. That's a big one. And then uh, another one is power down your devices when you're not using them. If you got a printer that's sitting over in the corner that you only use it once a month for kids' homework or something, unplug that thing because you know what? It's radiating Wi-Fi throughout your house the whole time. Uh, and you're not even using it. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go a little bit further, you can even turn circuits off at night when you're sleeping to the sleeping area. Uh, yeah. We do that at our house, and a lot of my clients do that, and notice a, a really big difference. Um, going through your kitchen and getting rid of anything with the Teflon or the nonstick coating mm -hmm. that's got the PFOAs, the forever chemicals in it, uh, getting rid of the plastics, start switching things over to glass and stainless steel and wood. Um, that's going to make a big impact. I mean, if you could do those things right there, that's really big. And also filter your water. You, yeah. you, know, you shouldn't be drinking tap water these days. <laughs> it's, really it's, my big, it's my biggest pet peeve. It's like, I don't understand how restaurants still do it. Like filters are yeah. so simple and easy yeah. to, to have and to offer tap water. And people like stick up for it. They're like, oh, yeah. tap water is fine. Stop being so fancy. It's like, no, it's not. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> it's contaminated. It's horrible. There's so much nasty stuff in it. And get, get a couple of air filters too, you know. I always say, like, what are your four, favorite there? Uh, uh, Jasper. Uh, Jasper okay. is a is really, really good air filter. It checks all the boxes off. Plus, they look great. I have one in every single room in my house uh, just because I believe the, for me, it, when I talk about the foundations, the basic level is clean air, clean water, clean food, and clean thoughts. Yep. If you can do those four things, that's the foundation. Like, you've got to do those things first before you even look at anything else. But unfortunately, a lot of people aren't, you know, those are those four things. If you really think about it and analyze it, that's really takes some effort, but that should, shouldn't be that way. That should be the foundation for everybody. Yeah. And if, if like a Jasper isn't on your list or something, are there ones to look like, what do you look for? Let's say, because I know some people have different budgets. Some people can't afford a molecule or a uh, Dr. Clean or whatever, Dr. Air, um, Air Doctor. Like what? What are the things you should probably look for if you want to purchase something to purify the air? You know, if you're on a budget, go down to Home Depot and pick up one of those box fans for thirty five bucks, and then pick up an air filter and some duct tape and tape it to the back and run that thing. It's fifty, sixty dollars, and you got yourself an air filter. Yeah, the, the like a, a higher Merv on the air, like on the actual filter, yeah, right? Yeah, to like get a, allergens out and everything, right? Yeah, like a Merv eleven filter, a twenty yeah. by. You tape it right to the back of your box fan and boom, there you go. And just run it, have circulating air. You'll be catching things in that, right? And that's yep. that's the good thing. And ventilation is a wonderful thing, as we know this, even during things like the pandemic, you know, ventilation was probably the best thing we could have. That sunlight, you know, fresh air was was really the, the best we can do in stopping transmission in many ways. So 
uh, I will say stagnant air. And like you said, unfortunately, so many of these new buildings, you can't even open a window. They're all like kind of they're they're efficient because they keep the heat in all this and everything. But you're not able to circulate the air. So something like that just to move in an, in an air stagnation, you know, in traditional Chinese medicine is death. Movement is life. So I think, uh, you know, that's something we could do as well. Um, you know, if, if people want to get started with you, what what are the first steps? You know, I would say I have a, a lot of good podcasts I've done like this with you, and we have them on our website, uh, probably 30 of them or so now. And they're just really good free information. There's a lot of, I'm talking a lot of times with other experts that are very smart, and there's a lot of good information. And so, especially if you're, I'm more of a budget and just want to learn, you know, when you're at the gym or you're, you're doing uh, dishes or whatever, li- put on these podcasts and listen to them and just start learning and doing some of the basics. Um, you know, next step would be just jump on a call with me. Let's do a one-on-one and let's go through your home and let's really help dial it in. Um, there's so many things that we can do to help make changes. Uh, our Instagram channel, we have a ton of free content, a lot of free education on there. We're always posting helpful tips. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram. I mean, those are really the best ways right off the bat to get started. Yeah. Ryan, I wanted to ask you one question I forgot about, but it's something we we bring up that not many people know about. So I'm just curious if if you know about it or even kind of incorporate it in this idea of a clean and and healthy home is geopathic stress. Stress mm-hmm. from kind of, you know, the the underground you if you're near a fault or an underground river, which can kind of disrupt. Is that something you ever look at or bring up with anybody you work with? Absolutely. So I have my dousing rods and I use yep. my dousing sticks and I go through the house. Oh, I love and it. <laughs> I go through and we look for these these fault lines or these ley lines because you don't want to be sleeping or spending time Absolutely. on one of these lines. It can cause um, uh, stress in the body with the magnetic field. Our, our body has a magnetic field. Our heart has a magnetic Even our cells have a magnetic field and they all need to be aligned and working properly. And if we go through one of these zones where these magnetic fields are distorted, it can distort the body's magnetic field. And that's fundamentally at the lower level. That's how our bodies are working. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, by the way, because we you know, sometimes have to talk to patients where we believe that is the case, whether it's California or other areas you know, where there is more geopathic stress in general, and people just dismiss it. And on the, the other side, we've actually told families to move out of a home that just had a, a, a lot of geopathic stress that was tested outside by someone and when they did huge improvements and and what you see sometimes and i'm sure you see this is when you've exhausted all possibilities of what could be causing your issues around you let's say and and you've really cleaned up your own lifestyle it can be your home and it could either be things like mold emf or it could be something even more hidden that so few people really know about almost no doctors i speak to really know about is geopathic stress so I love that you're testing for it because absolutely we've seen this time and time again that that can be that that straw that breaks the camel's back for you in your condition and you need to move out of that environment. And again, it's very much like mold and other things. If you take yourself out of the environment and you feel better, then that's probably what is the issue. But sometimes it is subtle. You don't feel it right away. You start to improve, but you say, maybe it's not that. You go back to that. Uh, have you noticed that that like with your clients that you see geopathic stress sometimes? Yeah, sometimes that can be the case, you know, when it's going over the bed and they don't sleep very well, they wake up with achy joints or something. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's why we look at the whole big picture. That's why I don't just do EMF or just mold or yeah. just chemical or air. I look at all of the things, anything that could possibly cause any kind of illness or symptom. Because when I'm done with the home, I want to make sure confidently they can say, okay, whatever is affecting you now, we know at least it's not your environment because your environment is dialed in. Do you work with practitioners? A lot. Yeah. 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 No, I can yeah. imagine this. This is really important. And I, I love that idea of being able to kind of take someone, you know, and say, maybe it's your home here, you know, look at this and, and connect with this person, test my home and see what's going on and substantiate that. Because I feel like too many doctors overlook that. They look inside the body only and don't ask about the environment that is creating something inside the body that is the the root cause of what's going on inside your body. So I think it's it's critically important. I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Where can people learn more about you, Test My Home? Uh, testmyhome.com. Our Instagram is Test My Home. Facebook's Test My Home. 
Uh, we have pretty good SEO. Just Google it in. We'll, we'll pop up. But, you know, to your point before that, I see in the future where it's a hand in hand, the doctor and the home doctor and the body doctor are working together. That's some of our best success stories is working with a really good doctor like you that understands what's going on with the body and then working with someone like me that understands the home and making sure that the outside environment and the inside environment and the body are both clean and in tune and pure. And that's really when we see magic happen. I love that. Couldn't agree more. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. And remember, go check out testmyhome.com for more information. And until next time, continue writing your own healing story.